So many questions remain behind the shooting death of six-year-old Jeremy Martin. The man had autism and ran away just prior to today's shooting. But this time, police claim he lunged at them with this steak knife, cutting one of the officers, and they shot him. We have all seen the headlines across the country involving law enforcement and interactions with members of the public. Law enforcement is a dangerous job in the times we live in today. Some encounters with police have become deadly. In the Chicago area, a 15-year-old teen with autism was recently shot and killed by police. First responders may also face tragic accidental drownings because children with autism are attracted to water and have no sense of danger. Drowning fatalities following wandering incidents remain a leading cause of death among those with autism spectrum disorders, or ASD. This video is to give law enforcement and first responders a basic overview and a proper protocol to identify the signs when encountering a person with autism so that a deadly incident does not occur and officers and emergency personnel have the tips and tools they need to de-escalate an interaction. And you'll see him, his facial structure will completely change. He'll get this look on his face and he'll start to do animal claws. And then he'll threaten to kill them. I'm going to kill you. Um, I'm going to blow this school up. Can you imagine the reaction if the wrong person heard him say that? While law enforcement and first responders undergo a substantial amount of crisis intervention training and interacting with mentally ill individuals, Autism is not classified as a mental illness, and further training is necessary to increase awareness of this condition. According to a national study by the FBI in 2001, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are seven times more likely to come into contact with law enforcement than those without a disability. This video is to help law enforcement and first responders better understand individuals who are impacted with autism. My name is Charles Chester. Uh, I'm a law enforcement officer. I've uh, been in law enforcement in some capacity for well over 20 years. Uh, I've worked patrol, investigations, training. Um, and, and with that training, uh, I, I thought about the, this video uh, because I have a son who has, has autism. He's 16 years old. And uh, one, of my, one of my biggest fears is that he's going to come in contact with law enforcement and they won't understand what they're dealing with. Um, so what I'd like to do is create a video to put the awareness out there to first responders and police officers um, to recognize the symptoms of autism and learn about ways to m mitigate any potential uh, volatile situations. 49% of children with autism wander from a safe environment. Wandering is one of the number one issues emergency responders will face. Oh, well, you got some ants on there, huh? Yeah, yuck! Do you know where your parents are? Yeah, it's a yuck. Okay. Oh, see if we can oh. see them anywhere. Well, my name is Dan with the fire department. We're here trying to help you. Do you know where your parents are if we go try mm -hmm. to find them? Are you okay? Hey. What's going on? Uh, we found them wandering yeah. and we're just trying to get some information. Okay. Uh, how about what's your name? Do you have any ID on you? Any type of information or a cell phone? The paramedics and fire department in Williamson County, Texas, and the Autism Society of Central Texas worked with us on several emergency scenarios with local teens with autism. Children with autism typically have difficulty with verbal and nonverbal communication, and in many cases may not be able to respond to their name being called or understand your instructions. Hey, my name's Kevin. Can I shake your hand? How you doing? What's your name? Can you tell me your name? Yeah? Are you hurting anywhere? No? Do you want to go sit in our ambulance and let's talk? Can we talk with you for a little bit? The first responders are showing how to best interact with this teen who has autism by explaining and showing him what they will do to take his blood pressure so he won't be afraid and have a meltdown trigger. See what it's doing? It's just squeezing my arm, okay? Can I do that to your arm? Is it okay if I do that to your arm, bud? Can we take your jacket off to try to do it on your arm? No, you wanna keep your jacket on? Okay. Oh, there you go. 
autism is prevalent. Statistics show 1 in 68 births will be an autistic child. And boys have four times more of a risk of being born with autism than girls. So the chances of a law enforcement officer or a first responder coming in contact with a person with autism, possibly a young adult male, is very high. And if approached the wrong way, could lead to a deadly or dangerous outcome. It's a huge, huge problem. It's a huge learning curve. I think it's a huge learning curve for everybody because not everyone understands what autism is or ASD. Um, and so I think it's just getting the right education and being open to answering questions, asking the right questions, knowing certain things like touching. Uh, you know, an individual with, with autism might absolutely hate touch. And so in, you know, not, not meaning to, you can set someone off just by touching their shoulder and they can start screaming, biting. Because when you see someone with autism and you meet another one the next day, they could be completely different from each other. Um, there is a saying that says, if you've met one person with autism, you've met only one person with autism just because they look so different across the board. Nobody is, no two are alike. Um, so autism, there's three core symptoms. So um, there are deficits in communication. Um, in uh, social understanding um, and in their uh, interests. They tend to have very narrow, restricted interests or repetitive um, behavior patterns. Um, so individuals affected with autism will have a hard time communicating um, and also reading other people's nonverbal cues. Police officers are trained to roll up on the scene and make immediate eye contact with a person being pulled over. If they look suspicious or don't look you in the eye, training tells you this person has something to hide or may be on drugs. But that can also be a key sign that this person may have autism. We're seeing this where first responders um, maybe jump to conclusions or make assumptions about the person's character because of the lack of eye contact, because of the poor or limited communication skills, they make assumptions about what that person's been doing or who they are and perhaps um, you know, arrest them. For this training video, we worked with law enforcement officers in Smithville, Texas. The police officers did this scenario with a young man with autism after a suspicious person call in a local park. You don't have any type of weapons or anything on you, do you? No knives or anything like that? Nope. No? Nothing. Nothing? Mm -mm. Do you mind if I check you real quick? No nope. problem. You're okay? I'm okay. I can, can I check you real quick just nope. to make sure you have no weapons? Nope. No? Nothing. Okay. You have an ID? Nope. No ID? Mm -mm. Okay. Do you, what's your name? Ian. While there is not one physical characteristic or a single trait that distinguishes autism, even with the best of intentions, spotting and properly dealing with the signs of mental illness and disability are special challenges for first responders. Individuals with autism don't always react to things like eye contact, commands, sounds, and changes in their environments the way most people do. It's difficult to rec recognize a person with aut autism right away. You have to spend at least you know, 30 seconds with them. You can't just look at someone and say that person has autism um, because they look just like you and me. It's all, it's all in mannerisms. It's um, negative eye contact. It's... Uh, so a lot of times their posture. One of the fastest growing needs for us is how to properly interact uh, and, and be able to handle different types of situations when dealing with individuals who do have special needs. Hello. What are you guys doing uh, here? We're with the fire department. My name is B. What's your name? Danielle. Danielle. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey, wait a minute. We all have met. For police officers and first responders, spotting the possible signs and symptoms of autism and being patient is very important. In this scenario, the Round Rock Fire Department is responding to a call about a seizure. My name is Dan, fire department. What's your name? Uh, he, he's nonverbal. He can't talk. All right. I mean, he can tell you. What's going on today, kid? What's the problem? Um. He, he may have had a seizure. John has autism and seizure disorder. He has trouble speaking, but fortunately on this call, he is with his mother. This is just going to squeeze your arm, okay? 
And this one's going to go on your finger. The medical professionals are very patient with John while they check his blood sugar. All right, on the count of three, small little poke. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. Oh, hold on. No, they have it's to get okay. the blood. So done. they have so to get. The, gonna... <laughs> they have to it's get okay. the blood. It's they okay. have to get the blood out of there, John. Watch, That's watch, the watch. One second, real quick. You're doing a good job. Yeah. You're doing great. Because John, if we have to do it again, then you're going to be even sadder. Perfect. There. Oh, That's all I need. You want a band aid? Sensory overload is common with individuals who have autism. License hirings would be a big deal, um, particularly in the evening. Where, where lights are bright and they're, they're reflecting off of everything. Um, to them, that's like being on a battlefield. Hey John, so these are silk belts, right? You put on the seat yeah. the car. Once they get John into the ambulance, they very carefully explain to him what they're going to do next to check his vital signs. Can I check your pulse? Can I touch your John, wrist? he needs his, yeah, give him your hand. Can there I you roll go. your sleeve up? I'm just going to touch your wrist here. The EMS workers and firefighters in the Austin suburb of Round Rock Hi. are working with teens impacted with autism to see their reaction when being approached Hi. in what could be an emergency situation. It's a valuable learning experience for all those involved. When she has her seizures, does she kind of just stare off or does she have full Yes, body? she just stares off and sometimes she will just freeze. She's a twin and both she and her sister have autism. She has ADHD and okay. um, she's recently had a, a pretty substantial cognitive regression. So she has oh. uh, her ability to speak is very limited. Okay. So when people talk to her, you have to make sure that you get her eye contact and that she's she understands what you're saying and you need to speak very slowly so she okay. understands. I think it's important that we let our larger community know about autism, and especially our first responders who are often at intense crisis situations or um, at times of real emergencies with our families when awareness is um, really important. If kids are, uh, or young adults are anxious or having an outburst or something's happening and they're not aware of autism, it could present in a very different way. Aggression is common during rescues, even if police or firefighters are trying to save their lives. Treat each case as critical. Children with autism have an impaired sense of danger and face immediate risk. Trying to restrain an individual with autism that is already not understanding what's going on and that's apparent in their aggressive behavior. So they're in a fight or flight mode is only going to trigger um, a, a more severe outburst or a more severe behavior. Um, and it's very common for them to start engaging in um, head banging, um, biting, spitting, throwing. Um, and so you really want to um, look for signs that they already feel threatened. So, so situations that I go through with Josh, um, struggles, uh, getting off the bus, <laughs> getting in the car, um, taking his medication, which we don't give him a lot, but there, there's some that we have to, we have to give him, um, getting in the bathtub. Um, he can become aggressive, not only with me and my wife, but with himself. Um, he, you know, head banging, um, hitting himself in the head, um, slamming his head against the wall, those sorts of things. So that's part of the catalyst for this video is, you know, if I, 10 years ago, if I was working the street and I saw someone doing that, the first thing I'd probably think of is some sort of narcotics. Um, and then I would immediately think, you know, that's a threat to me. Kathy Whittington's son, Matthew, was diagnosed with autism in kindergarten. I was lucky enough to have a teacher that was willing to film him. Part of that was a motivator for him because he knew he was being filmed and mom was going to see it. They had a room basically where they had some sensory items and the kids had the option of just, okay, I need a timeout. They could take them in there. They wouldn't disrupt the other students. So Matthew's in this room sitting on the floor and he proceeds to start yelling and screaming that, you know, making threats. And then he's banging his head uh, with his fist. And he's doing it pretty hard because I've never really seen him do a lot of self-oriented violence. But my understanding is that he does bite himself at school. Um, and then he was hitting himself in the head. And when he does that, he hits himself in the head. And then he falls backwards to the floor 
and he says, ouch, and he falls backwards to the floor. So he was acting out, but he was using SpongeBob in order to do it. So it comes off comical, but it really isn't comical in the sense that this is him in the middle of a full-on meltdown. Now Matthew is a freshman in high school. Part of their anxiety is the fact that they are afraid of anything that's new and unfamiliar. That's why they're so rigid and, and they want their routines and their schedules. It's because they're afraid of what they don't know or what they're not prepared for. Matthew's stepfather, Corporal Dan Whittington, has been a law enforcement officer for nearly 30 years. If you can expose the police department to them, expose them to the police department, get them comfortable around police, they may still have some behaviors, but maybe not as severe. They may see the police officer not as a threat. Um, people with autism are very um, rigid a lot of times. They don't like anything that, that's a surprise. But if they learn to know that there's a police officer, he wears a uniform and a gun, and he's showing up, and he's there for a reason, then maybe um, it's kind of a two-way street. There's communication between both parties at that point. Whether it's language or whether it's with your actions, you really want to take um, one step at a time, and you want to be slow about um, your approach. Um, so it gives them time to process the situation because they're not processing your words very easily. They're uh, much more um, concrete thinkers, very literal. Um, and language um, often, particularly the English language, um, can be confusing because there are so many idioms. So if they say, I'm, 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 do you wave your rights? And they're waving their right, literally waving their right. And so for my son or for anyone, you know, there's oh, that lack of communication, the literal communication, and that heightens anxiety when someone touches you, perhaps. This acronym is helpful in training first responders. A, approach the person in a quiet, non-threatening manner. U, understand that touching a person with autism may cause a fight or flight reaction. T, talk to the person in a calm voice. Pause and wait for an answer when giving directions or asking questions. The person with autism may be processing slowly, and repeating what you said without giving them time to answer may slow their response down. I. Instruct the person simply and directly. S. Seek to evaluate the situation as it's unfolding. M. Maintain a safe distance and be able to retreat, if necessary, to de-escalate the situation. He's coming. He's mm -hmm. Law enforcement officers should be predictable and give the person with autism a chance to process who they are, what they want, and why they are there. In this scenario, the police officer approaches the passenger side of the car, and the boy has ASD. But planning, not doing anything unexpected. Tell them what you're going to do. Look, I, I need to check you to make sure you don't have any weapons. You don't have any guns, knives. You don't, and you can even ask them, and then tell them, I'm going to touch your legs, I'm going to touch your waist, and as I'm doing this, I'll tell you what I'm doing. And you can pat that person down uh, doing that. As long as, a lot of times, as long as you let them know, what you're doing and prepare them, they're okay. And, and you know, the key is preparation. Deep touch actually is better um, than very soft touch. So um, patting them down actually is okay. They're, um, in fact, one of the um, things we tell parents to do in a child autism is give them a deep hug because um, um, that provides much more, um, that squeeze effect um, allows their central nervous system to calm down um, and allows them to kind of de-escalate a little bit. Some people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are known as bolters or runners. They're captivated by small distractions and are prone to take off without warning. They are also attracted to running toward water, traffic, or one of their favorite places. Uh, unpredictable sounds like sirens, um, uh, fireworks, um, dogs barking, um, those are all things that can trigger a child to want to escape, run off, um, uh, get into the corners, um, self-stem, be aggressive. I've seen um, kids that have to be locked up at night in order to keep them safe. Um, most houses I go into have several locks and chains on the doors. Um, to keep them in because they run, and so that's a huge concern. 
that they can run out the front door, they could hurt themselves, they could get into something they're not supposed to get into. And so most parents have an extreme fear, it seems like, um, if their child is prone to behaviors like that. The National Autism Association reports that 91% of children who drown in the U.S. are children with autism. If they are missing, check waterways first. So with the runner, right, we obviously would, we would go back to the last known point of uh, visual contact, but even while we are approaching the scene, hopefully we get some kind of, are they in pajamas? Are they, they don't have a shirt on, is it 3 a.m.? Well, we can start narrowing down those people, right, as we're, as we're coming into the scene. Um, but the, the autism community and those individuals tend to be heavily drawn towards water. And so one of the big, big things that we are very, we wanna make sure we cover is, any, any backyard pools, uh, jacuzzis, creeks, if there's a neighborhood uh, lake, anything like that. We also wanna make sure that those people that start searching that area are very aware of those waters. A fire emergency could be another unique challenge for individuals with autism who may retreat deeper into the burning home to avoid the noise of the smoke detector. Some run from firefighters trying to save them or refuse to leave the home because their senses are overloaded. The chaotic events of a fire can cause the child with autism to run back into the burning home to seek comfort in a safe place like their bedroom, under the bed, or a closet, even if it will jeopardize their life. Uh, it's probably going to be a high heat, high smoke, um, you know, very stressful environment. Um, you know, our, our biggest priority is to just locate the people and get them out as soon as possible. Um, you know, we deal with this with also not only um, people with autism, but also young children, you know, will be sometimes scared of firefighters. You know, we're wearing a lot of equipment. You can't see our face. We're breathing air. Um, it's, a little, it's a little bit, it's a scary addition to an already scary situation. Um, so I'd usually just kind of follow my main protocol, which is, you know, um, to locate the victims as quickly as possible and grab them and get them out. There is no known single cause of autism, and it is the fastest growing developmental disability. But studies show that early diagnosis and intervention can lead to significantly improved outcomes. When you have autism, it doesn't look the same, and so it's very hard to identify. I think it's important that people know that it affects all ages and stages. It's not something that just goes away. When you reach adulthood, it's something that impacts you throughout your lifespan. And so while you may not know right away what's going on with your child, there's a kind of grieving process that when you do get that diagnosis, that cycles through. So, um, you know, things like major milestones like driving or going to university or getting married, there are no guarantees for any of us, but certainly no guarantees with our families. Well, my son's name is Nolan and he's going to be uh, 11 years old this month and he was diagnosed with um, autism, I think he was about um, a little, little over two years of age, um, so he's made great strides over the last, you know, nine years <laughs> that we've been dealing with this. Um, it's taken a lot of work, um, it's taken a lot of therapy, and um, it's definitely, uh, you know, definitely an ongoing um, process, but um, I'm extremely proud of him, and um, I just, I love him to death. It's a constant battleground. I mean, and it's not just, it's not just once in a while. It's not, you know, he had a bad day today. It's, it's every day, it's every five minutes. It's not an hour by hour battle. It's not a day by day battle. It's a minute by minute battle. So the Autism Society is here to provide information, referrals and support, education, advocacy and recreational opportunities. And so this is a big part of what we've been trying to do is help educate both the autism community about first responders and I, letting first responders know about autism. So this is really important for our families because it's kind of a mutually beneficial opportunity. We're learning about what their needs are and what first responders might be looking for. And um, equally, first responders, I think, will learn more about what autism is and how it presents in a crisis. Through actions like this video, this training, through integration into the, into the society of individuals with disabilities, and through media communications, we have the ability to enlighten people and to empower them as parents, as educators, as first responders. And I feel like it's our responsibility to do so. For more information about autism resources for first responders, 
go to these websites where additional training materials can be found. Autism Society of America Safe and Sound Initiative. National Autism Association Big Red Safety Box. Autism Speaks Wandering Resources.